Welcome to Macro Peace Theater. I'm your narrator, Emil Kalinowski. Today, our story comes to us from Liberty Street Economics, the blog of the Federal Reserve of the Bank of New York, serving the second district and the nation. On the 20th of October, 2021, there was a blog post under the title of The International Experience of Central Bank Asset Purchases and Inflation. And our bloggers are Gianluca Benigno, let me try again, Gianluca Benigno and Paolo Pesenti. And what do they tell us? They take a look at the world and they say, everyone's been doing QE. Everyone wants to have inflation, the central bankers. Does QE cause inflation? Why should QE cause inflation? Has QE caused inflation? Spoiler alert, why hasn't QE caused inflation? Recent inflationary pressures in the global economy have rekindled the debate on the link between money growth and price stability. Specifically, Does rapid central bank money creation resulting from large-scale purchases of government securities fuel inflationary spending by households and firms? We argue that there are many valid reasons to be skeptical about this textbook narrative. In this post, we look at the international experience with regard to asset purchases, money growth, and inflation dynamics in the pre-COVID era in an attempt to draw lessons from the recent past. Most notably, we find that the view that large-scale purchases of sovereign debt cause unmanageable inflationary pressures is not supported by the experiences of foreign advanced economies. As a matter of fact, despite the extent and duration of the quantitative easing programs in those economies, central banks face challenges in achieving their inflation objectives. Part 2. Background The global financial crisis of 2008-09 pushed major foreign advanced economies to reduce their official policy rates to historically low levels and provide extensive forward guidance on how long the rates would remain at their effective lower bounds. In addition, central banks in Japan, the United Kingdom, and the Euro area embraced unconventional monetary policies, including quantitative easing with purchases of long-term public debt and, in some instances, private sector financial assets, all with the objective of providing accommodation and meeting their respective inflation targets. Indeed, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England all share relatively similar policy objectives. The Bank of Japan Act states that the central bank's monetary policy should aim to achieve price stability which is identified as a 2% year-on-year rate of change in the consumer price index. The ECB, before its recent review of the monetary framework, defined price stability as a year-on-year increase in the harmonized index of consumer prices for the euro area of below but close to 2%. Similarly, the Bank of England sets monetary policy with the objective of reaching the government target of 2% for consumer price inflation. Moreover, all of these institutions operate within similar structural economic frameworks in which sovereign debt is issued in domestic currency and the exchange rate fluctuates freely. Part 3. Central Bank Balance Sheets and Asset Purchases In engaging in QE operations, central bank purchase government bonds, financing the purchases by issuing bank reserves, thus increasing both the central bank's assets and liabilities. The following charts illustrate the pre-COVID evolution of the selected central bank's balance sheets in major advanced economies. We note several similarities. First, there has been a large increase in the size of major central bank's balance sheets. The balance sheet of the Bank of Japan increased sixfold from the early 2000s. The ECB's balance sheet by approximately four times since 2009. And the Bank of England five times, starting from the pre-global financial crisis period. Second, given the nature of the QE operations, that is, buying mainly government bonds in the secondary market, these central banks have accumulated a sizable fraction of the domestic government debt. 
Indeed, by the end of 2019, the Bank of Japan held 43% of the outstanding government debt. The Bank of England held 32% of the debt, and the ECB held 24% of euro area government debt. By the year end 2019, the Bank of England's holdings of gilts represented approximately 53% of the change in outstanding gilts since December 2008. The Bank of Japan purchased more than the total change in national debt during the same period, namely 158%, while the ECB absorbed 72% of the increase in euro area sovereign debt. Finally, the increase on the asset side of the central bank's balance sheet was mostly matched on the liability side by an increase in the stock of excess reserves of the banking sector. In other words, total deposits for the Bank of Japan, liabilities to the euro area credit institutions for the ECB, and sterling reserve balance liabilities for the Bank of England. The aforementioned sizable upward changes in the share of government debt owned by central banks could point to widespread expectations of inflationary financing. Yet, there was no discernible upward movements in underlying inflation, as shown in the chart below, which summarizes the evolution of inflation for Japan, the euro area, and the United Kingdom. We plot both core inflation measures and headline inflation. Part 4. The rationale behind asset purchases. Central bank asset purchases aim to stimulate spending by influencing longer-term interest rates. Lower interest rates boost durables consumption and investment spending working to meet the inflation target as demand and prices increase. The mechanism of transmission can be split into a number of interdependent channels describing how QE is meant to promote spending. Specifically, central bank purchases of financial assets A. Lower both short and longer term rates, reduce term premia, and prompt agents to rebalance their portfolios thus supporting an easing in broad financial conditions. B. Provide a signal about the evolution of the policy stance. C. Create capital gains for households that hold these assets, thus boosting wealth. D. May make banks more willing to lend because the reserves created by asset purchases increase the availability of bank credit. While all these channels point to a moderately effective role of asset purchases in stimulating the economy, the international experience under consideration does not support the view that such purchases create a rise in inflation rates. Particularly compelling is the lack of evidence supporting the conventional interpretation of QE as related to the money multiplier approach. Let's briefly summarize the underlying logic. From an accounting point of view, the central bank creates additional excess reserves for the banking system when it buys government bonds, thus increasing the monetary base, which consists of banknotes and bank reserves with the central bank. Banks get a new asset, central bank funds, that replaces the asset they sell. Now, According to the textbook narrative, there is a fairly stable money supply process driven by the actions of the central bank. The key assumption is that both banks and money holding, the money holding sector respond in a predictable way to an increase in the monetary base. The volume of broad money supply to the economy is then determined as a multiple of the monetary base. According to this framework, therefore, the increase in reserves prompts banks to make more loans and create additional deposits equal to a multiple of this increase. The creation of additional deposits stimulates spending and drives up prices. The more massive the scale of asset purchase programs, the argument goes, the more upward pressure on prices.
final chapter, the fall of money multipliers. But the international experience is that the large volume of reserves did not lead to a corresponding increase in broad money. Indeed, the evidence points to a large decline in the money multipliers. See the following chart. How can we interpret these recent experiences? One perspective builds upon what is referred to as the endogenous money approach. According to this logic, banks' lending is not dictated by reserves, but by the extent to which commercial banks are willing to extend loans to their customers based on the profitability of those loans, regulatory considerations, and the creditworthiness of customers. From an economic logic perspective, the reason that commercial banks might be reluctant to lend deposits on the extent to which they assess their, they are creditworthy customers so that the return on their loans is larger in risk-adjusted terms that the return than the return on reserves. Other formal constraints on bank lending stem from the capital requirements that relate to quantity and quality of the assets that banks must hold to fulfill regulatory obligations. On the demand side, in an environment of low interest rates, agents may be unwilling to take advantage of the greater availability of liquidity to finance consumption or investment spending simply if money in the form of cash or deposits is just as remunerative as other assets, agents have an incentive to hoard it without increasing their consumption. Similarly, firms might not invest if they expect sales to be depressed, resulting in a low demand of loans by the private sector. In this case, money velocity falls and money multipliers shrink. Central bank liabilities increase considerably, but nominal spending does not. According to this approach, the international experience does not suggest that quantitative easing is necessarily inflationary. Instead, it will be challenging to observe inflationary pressure associated with central bank reserves growth in a world of low natural interest rates related to demographic and structural drivers, other structural drivers. Whether these lessons shed light on the post-COVID environment will depend, among other factors, on how the gap between aggregate supply and demand will be closed and to what extent fiscal policy over the medium term may boost aggregate demand and natural real interest rates, possibly offsetting the high propensity to save by the private sector. Thank you for listening to this episode of Macro Peace Theater. This was an excellent piece. It offers an insight into the thinking of the people and in charge of monetary policy. And there's uh, several conclusions we can draw from this. One, A, they're only saying QE is not inflationary because it's a conspiracy and they want to drive inflation rates higher and destroy savings. That's one possible explanation, right? Because, you know, that's a lot of good people believe that there's a conspiracy, the central banks are evil, and they're, they're corrupt, etc., etc. Uh, it's not an unreasonable, unreasonable uh, statement, belief. I'm not going to dismiss that. I don't believe that. But I can understand where people are coming with, from with that. Very interesting, though. The other possibility is... These authors are telling us that the central banks are not central. That reserves, no matter all the action by the central bank, first has to be filtered through banks. Banks have to decide whether or not they want to extend loans, whether they believe there's going to be any profit in it, whether there's going to be regulatory considerations, whether or not their customers are credit worthy. So we're de-emphasizing the central bank. This is a big step by central bankers. Then, number two, on the demand side, they say in an environment of low interest rates, agents may be unwilling to take advantage of the greater availability of liquidity to finance consumption or investment spending. 
again, de-emphasizing the central bank and rightly putting forward the ginormous private consum consumer sector. Why might agents be unwilling to consume? Might it be because they see themselves in a terrible, terrible economic situation? One that's been lasting now for almost a generation that began in 2007. It's 2021, 2022. That's 15 years. We are only five years short of a generation of the slowest economic growth in 150 years. And not only that, we keep having shocks every few years. So you're really gonna go out there, go bananas and go crazy and go spend because somebody's creating bank reserves out the wazoo? Not in year 15, year 16, year 20, after witnessing a, the, the recent past. You're lucky you have a job. You know you're not gonna get a big raise and you're gonna, you're gonna go spend like with abandon? No perfectly rational behavior and it's even longer in Japan where it has been a generation or two now where we've observed this another thing here where else what else are we looking at here the rationale be, be, behind asset purchases so QE is supposed to promote spending because lower rates prompt agents to rebalance their portfolios, thus supporting an easing in broad financial conditions. This is something that Jeff Snyder and I talk about all the time, and it is uh, Milton Friedman's plucking model, or it's the, oh Jesus, the unit root. It's the idea that we live in a, we live in a normal time. So yes, reduce short-term interest rates and long-term rates, if we live in a normal era of economic growth, of course, you're gonna spend more, buy more, invest more, because you live in a great economic era. What is the unit root? A unit root is a mathematical expression that says uh, that we go to hell, okay? And the same thing with the plucking model, Milton Friedman's plucking model, where you pluck the guitar string and it goes back to the condition it was. Well, guess what? When the condition it was, was growth, trend growth. Well, guess what? how he came about with that uh, formulation, that outlook, that thesis? By reviewing eras that excluded terrible shocks. The best example, World War II and the Great Depression. He left that out of his review of US economic history. Why? Well, because that's not gonna happen again. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often. How often does it happen? Let's call it once every four generations is how often it happens. Once every three generations or so. Guess what? Right on schedule. So, these assumptions of QE are built for a normal world. We're not in a normal world. Number two here, provide a signal about the evolution of policy stance. Yeah, because you think the central bank is central and what the central bank does is very important. I guess, I guess, but I don't think so. Create capital gains for households that hold these assets, thus boosting wealth. Guess what? We're in an era of extreme inequality that we haven't seen this level of inequality since, surprise, the 1930s, the last time we had a Great Depression. This level of wealth inequality means that the households that do hold assets are wealthy. Guess what? The wealthy don't spend as much as the average household does. So yes, capital gains for households, great in a normal era when all of us are moving across the different income, income deciles and moving up and down the wealth curve because there's money to be made, an economy that's growing, and we believe that we're in the middle class or the lower middle class, but we've been moving up to the upper middle class or to become wealthy ourselves. Well, that's not happening. And therefore, all the gains are concentrated with those that hold assets, they don't consume as much, and therefore, this QE policy is hopeless. It would have worked, I guess, maybe in an era of regular growth, 
It didn't work in Japan because they were now in a depression. It hasn't worked anywhere else in the rest of the world because we're in a depression too. And then here, here's the fourth point. May make banks more willing to lend because the reserves created by asset purchases increase the availability of bank credit. Yes, bank reserves are like pennies. And if someone gave you a billion pennies or a hundred billion pennies, you know, all right, great. But it, boy, what a pain in the rear sector. That's not very easily fungible money. You can't convert that into readily usable money. You gotta go through a lot of steps to get that into the real economy, to make it a, into an investment. Same thing with bank reserves. That is so far removed from real economic activity. So many steps. And banks who want nothing more than to make money. Trust me, the biggest buildings in all of our cities belong to banks and hotels. Of course they're there to make money. And if you give them an inch, they'll take it. But guess what? They look at these reserves and they say, no, no, we're not interested in doing it for a whole host of reasons. So the rationale behind asset purchases makes sense in a normal world. And the people that implemented these policies in 2008 in the rest of the world and in 2000 in Japan assumed they were in a normal era. And I guess that's forgivable. But it's 2022 and they're still doing it? Pointless. Insanity. But they're scared. They're scared to try something new. Of course they are. Of course they are. They don't have the courage to do it. Courage is the least common human character trait. And we don't have it in our leaders. We have politicians and technocrats. We don't have statesmen or stateswomen or leaders. One day we will, and that will be even more dangerous and troubling and unsettling and volatile. But that day is coming. Surely it'll come this decade. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So there you go. The people, for some people at central banks and the Fed, they believe QE is not inflationary. And they gave reasons why. Great, good. Now the next step for them is to come up with a new plan. Let's see if they will.